-huh. Okay, so I'm Danielle Dixon with North Pacific Research Board. I'm uh, based in Anchorage, Alaska, and I'm here to talk to you a little bit about our new Arctic Integrated Ecosystem Research Program. And um, I'm specifically going to tailor this presentation a little bit more towards the logistics, so I don't have a whole lot of content on the, the science hypotheses and such. So if you have questions, feel free to ask them or um, contact me later. Um, but just basically, these integrated ecosystem research programs are uh, multidisciplinary marine science programs, and they involve a five-year uh, minimum commitment by the PIs who've been funded as part of these programs. And um, one of the unique hallmarks of these programs is that NPRB facilitates communication um, in a really active way throughout the five-year program. And so we hold annual mandatory PI meetings that occur over at least three days every year where we bring everyone associated with the program together to really talk through what are their results and how do they uh, make improvements in terms of multidisciplinary analyses and how do we go further in terms of making connections from physics and chemistry all the way up through biology and upper trophic levels. Um, we have uh, monthly uh, webinars or conference calls, and we also organize logistics planning meetings prior to every field season, where we have the, the core scientists that are involved in planning the logistics for every cruise get together and really hash through how do we make sure we are standardize, standardizing data collection protocols, and how do we prioritize um, sampling in the event that we have weather days, et cetera, um, so that everyone's on the same page before the field season starts. We have, uh, with this new program, we've got um, 27 funded PIs representing 11 different institutions. And that's just sort of at the top level. Many of these people will have postdocs and PhD students, et cetera, working with them. Um, and our uh, North Pacific Research Board um, provided um, the bulk of the money for this program, but we have serious um, commitments um, and partnership from Bureau of Ocean Energy Management the North Slope Borough Shell Baseline Studies Program, which is now known as the Collaborative Alaskan Arctic Studies Program, the Office of Naval Research, Marine Mammals and Biology Program, and we also had uh, significant in-kind support come in from our PIs from um, NOAA, from both Alaska Fishery Science Center and Pacific Marine Environmental Laboratory, and also from the University of Alaska Fairbanks. So all told, this program represents about a $15.5 million investment over the next five years. And in terms of the scope, um, the University of Alaska Fairbanks is planning springtime cruises in late May and early June of 2017 and 2018 aboard the ice-capable vessel, the Kuliak. And they'll be focusing in the northern Bering Sea and southern Chukchi Sea, you can see there in the map. And they'll be doing some um, exciting new measurements of rate processes, so things like rates of uh, growth, advection, reproduction, and deposition for primary and secondary productivity. And they'll be focusing on everything from physical and chemical and biological oceanography um, up. And they may also be doing some fish sampling and um, seabird and marine mammal visual observations as well. Then we have NOAA um, operating during the open water ice-free season in the fall time in 2017 and 2019. They'll be out there between mostly in August and September, potentially early October. And they'll be starting in the um, Beaufort Sea in that area uh, on the right of the map, and then uh, they'll be progressing um, south and west into the area shaded in pink in the northern Chukchi uh, next, and then finally the um, southern Chukchi Sea will be where they finish their field season. And they'll be um, collecting data on everything from physical and chemical oceanography up through uh, seabirds, but their real focus is looking at factors that drive the distribution and abundance of fish, particularly Arctic and saffron cod and pink and chum salmon. And they'll be deploying, um, they'll have shipboard observations from chartered fishing vessels, but they'll also be deploying several autonomous platforms as well, gliders, a sail drone, um, and some uh, moorings. We also have acoustic recorders that will record uh, data on marine mammal calls and anthropogenic noise. Most of those will be focused in that um, southern area in the Bering Strait and southern Chukchi Sea. And we also have a large social science component that will focus on Chukchi coastal communities' understanding of and responses to environmental change. 
And uh, that, that uh, social science component is uh, led by Dr. Henry Huntington, and he has co-PIs from Kawarek in the Bering Strait region and also the Northwest Arctic and North Slope boroughs. We're also um, doing our best to collaborate and coordinate with existing uh, federally funded research projects. We've worked uh, very closely with IARPIC to try to make connections wherever possible. And we have uh, secured commitments from 22 existing projects to collaborate with us. And so these projects have committed that they will send representatives to our annual PI meetings every year, and they will share data within our uh, data portal. And we're, we're interested, of course, in, in learning about new projects that would like to join us. We're uh, in the process of preparing an integrated work <laughs> that will be a concise document that describes the scope of the program and lays out some of the specific activities <coughs> and the cruise plans for each aspect of the program. So right now we have statements of work that come from proposals that were submitted by various uh, folks who were funded and now we're creating one, one concise document where you can find all the relevant information. And the hope is that that will be publicly available on our website in early September. And we intend that, we, we hope to you let the scientific community know that it's there, and we hope that folks would use it as a reference when they prepare proposals for other funding agencies to illustrate how whatever work they're proposing would fit in with what we're doing and leverage our program. We also developed a communications plan for this program, and we, it includes a list of contacts, so um, co-management organizations and uh, local government entities that, uh, and we've, we've got some two-page summaries that we prepared for our 2017 cruises. There's a picture of the first page of each of them here. And our plan is to uh, circulate those to all of the groups that are in our, um, listed in our list of contacts. So uh, if your group is also preparing a similar list of contacts, it would be great for us to, to see that and, and make sure we're hitting all of, all of the relevant groups. Um, we, we've, uh, we do intend to alter our cruise plans as necessary to avoid conflicts with subsistence harvest. We did have uh, our lead PIs for both the UAF and NOAA cruises give a presentation at the July uh, AEWC meeting here in Anchorage, and they uh, had some feedback. Um, we're, one of the things that uh, was mentioned earlier is, is that folks are interested in potentially moving sampling stations away from the, within 30 nautical miles of communities. So in particular, we're looking at that as, as an option for our cruises. Uh, we won't be in the water until spring of 2017, so we have a little bit of time to, um, to talk, talk with groups and make some alterations. Uh, as I mentioned, we, we did present at the Alaska Eskimo Whaling Commission meeting in July, and we're also <coughs> actively seeking opportunities to present at meetings of other marine mammal co-management organizations in particular. So we've reached out to the Eskimo Walrus Commission, the Indigenous Peoples Council on Marine Mammals, and some others. So uh, I've, I've put a slide here with our contact information. You've got my email there, as well as the emails for the leads on um, the UAF and NOAA cruises, uh, if you're interested in talking with them about their specific logistics. And uh, that's my presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I wanted to say in response about the community contacts, um, part of the um, <laughs> uh, standard of care document will be appendices that have um, contacts in coastal communities. And that's something we'll make sure that, sure that everyone gets and hopefully we'll be all working from that same document. Um, to reach out to communities. So thanks very much, Danielle, for that overview. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, great. So next we will hear from Kathy Cahill. Hello, everybody. So I was asked to give an overview of what we're doing at the Alaska Center for Unmanned Aircraft Systems Integration um, in terms of our opportunities to use unmanned aircraft in the Arctic and um, kind of an overview of the program, what type of projects we can undertake. 
So who are we? The first thing is we're the University of Alaska's Unmanned Aircraft Research Center. Um, we happen to be one of the six FAA test sites for unmanned aircraft integration, and our business director leads the FAA Center of Excellence for Unmanned Aircraft. We have been doing unmanned aircraft in the Arctic and Alaska since 2001. So we're kind of the grandfathers in the field in terms of doing unmanned aircraft in the Arctic. Um, we have done numerous uh, measurements in the Arctic, often with partners, and you'll hear from uh, Fairweather later. They are key in doing unmanned aircraft in the Arctic as well. And we work with you know, DOE at elliptic points. We have partners around the world. But the key thing is we deal with unmanned aircraft. And as cool as the technology is, an unmanned aircraft really is a pickup truck. Uh, unless you have the right command and control, unless you have the right payload, you're not going to be able to get the data you need in order to um, fulfill whatever your research mission happens to be. It's not just the aircraft. It's the pilots. It's the being able to communicate with the aircraft. It's being able to get the data back. It's being able to integrate everything to actually have the payload get you the data you need. So we have a series of our pickup trucks. Um, what you can see is a Quasi's fleet here. Uh, we have everything from a 40-pound catapult launch aircraft to, you know, two and a half-pound quad rotor. Uh, we've got a brand new aircraft coming online, Sea Hunter. She is a 300-pound maximum takeoff weight aircraft. The reason we have a variety is we want to make sure we match the right payload with the right platform. And so, what you need to do just a quick measurement of boreal forest health in a small region doesn't require the logistics of a large aircraft. And we specialize in providing platforms for folks who don't have them. We also work on developing payloads for the folks that need them. One of the things you'll see is a lot of our aircraft we have modified for work in the Arctic. So they are no longer straight engines, they're fuel injected, so the carburetor doesn't ice. We have heated pitot tubes, so you always have your airspeed. Um, We've been doing a lot of work in terms of how do you handle batteries in the cold. So for us, we have a range of capabilities, and it includes things from ship launch to hand thrown, to catapult to runway. So depending on what's available, we can potentially help you do unmanned aircraft work from just about any location in the Arctic. And of course, the Sukuliak is one of those places that we intend to be working um, in the future. So just to give you an idea, you can come back to me, check our website. Um, I'm just going to gloss over these quickly. We have done walrus studies. We've done measurements in terms of our sound um, frequency and decibels to make sure that we don't scare the animals. Um, we did discover that on the animals, no FAA regulations, so they all hauled out where we couldn't fly. Um, we can do three-dimensional sea ice. This was done actually off of Barrow to help the community determine what would be the easiest way to get their boats from the community into the leads for whaling. They have to chop through the pressure ridges um, by hand. If we can show how to avoid the pressure ridges, we save them a lot of time and effort. This was done with a simple hexacopter and a camera. So you can do some really neat things um, in terms of situational awareness. Other things, um, oil spill mitigation. This was a test where we actually created a lake um, did an oil spill in controlled circumstances, went through, put a herding agent on the oil, were able to clump it together enough that we could go through with another unmanned aircraft and ignite it. So this would be a way to do some remote oil spill remediation. Um, search and rescue, key in the Arctic, especially with the limited resources of aid. This is something that is very important and we're going to need to be able to do in cold weather conditions. And as you can see here, we are operating at minus 35. And of course, this is why we care. The Arctic's opening for a wide variety of things. There is going to be increased activity. We need to be able to see what is happening. We need to be aware of what is going on and what changes are occurring. And unmanned aircraft are a safe way to get that data. You're not putting pilots and biologists at risk a thousand miles off the coast. And of course, you can't do this alone. You have to do it with partners. And we're partnered here. This example is an aircraft that was being tested in Iceland. We also work with folks in Norway and with Canada. So 
we're really working on can we do pan-Arctic missions so we can get the data needed to inform climate models and all of those other things needed to understand what's happening. So our role really is to pull in the experts from the University of Alaska Fairbanks and other places and help them get the data they need in order to inform decision makers. Uh, relationships are very important. We are always looking for partners, people we can work with. And the key thing is that we have expertise, both Arctic and Antarctic, and we really would like to work with folks on this. So when do you use unmanned aircraft? When it's dirty, dull, and dangerous, and you can have it be a case where we may not always be the cheapest solution, but we may be the safest solution. Um, our systems need to be hardened for extreme cold. That's something that a lot of people forget, but is really key. Um, you can't just bring something up from the lower 48 and have it fly nicely. Communications between practitioners is going to be very, very important. We're all learning how to do this in the Arctic. It's non-trivial. And if we work together, sharing logistical costs can make deploying that mend aircraft more affordable. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and finish up quickly and give Church some of my time. And so are there any questions? Great. Thank you, Kathy. Um, is Shana next or Church? I'm, I'm at the ready, but I'm ready to go when you queue. Either way, we're... <laughs> Uh, I, so I have Shana next on the agenda that I'm looking at, okay, whichever Jessica can queue up. Uh. How's that? Okay. We've got Shana. I guess you yeah, still can't see Renee, right? right? I can see it. Yep. No, I, I, oh, okay. my computer caught up. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks everyone for inviting me. I appreciate it. Um, we have had the opportunity to work with a majority of the people that are, are here. Um, including Akwazi and Danielle and Murray, so I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, I am the program manager for Fairweather Science. Um, we're a small company um, incorporated in 2008, and it was part of the Chuck GC Environmental Studies Program that was started by ConocoPhillips and Shell. And we were incorporated in 2008, and we have a joint venture with the Lunick Corporation, which is the Alaska Native Corporation for the village of Wainwright. My staff, we have about five, seven full-time employees, and then I have contractors for various specialty services. And we've provided program management, safety, permitting, reporting, community outreach, logistics, um, agency interface, vessel logistics. We've kind of provided whatever we can. Um, and as some of you know, I'm very much into trying to get people to collaborate and communicate as much as possible. So we held um, Arctic Research Planning Night at the Marine Science Symposium just to try to bring everyone together to share information. And I've been in all of the different communities also um, trying to collaborate as much as possible. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> this, the next slide just shows you some of our Arctic experience and, and programs that we've been involved with. So as I said, we are the program manager for the Chukchi Sea Environmental Studies Program, or CSESP as we affectionately call it, and we do have the website. And this was a marine ecosystem study that was funded by ConocoPhillips, Shell, and Statoil starting in 2008, and it completed in 2014. And we did collaborate with, uh, with AOS and with NPRB to get all of the raw data up on the AOS website, which was no small feat by industry to allow for raw data to, to be available. So um, I think that's been a huge program to kind of start a lot of precedence within the scientific and industry communities. Um, we also managed the Beaufort um, Sea Mooring programs for Shell in 2010 and four, uh, through 14. So that was deploying and retrieving all of the acoustic recorders, uh, the bottom-mounted ADCPs, and ice profiling sonars. We're also involved in the drilling discharge monitoring programs for Shell um, 2012, 15, and uh, 16. So we just completed the phase four sampling on the Norseman II on Berger. And we were involved this year in the anchor salvage program for Shell. So there was a lot of um, large anchors and mooring systems that were left in for the barges. And my group was in charge of the vessels to pick them up, as well as all of the community outreach and permitting and um, marine mammal observations. For the Norseman too, we have um, we've provided the vessel and logistics coordination. And, and um, some of the pictures you've seen were off of the Norseman too. And it just shows that we, we've worked with all of the different groups at UAF, um, 
the Woodgates crews in the Bering Sea. We worked with BOEM, um, with Ambon, quite a few of the programs. And the idea behind this is we contract the vessel for the season, and then I try to fill it as much as possible so that everyone can share in the transit and mobilization costs. And we do all of the crew changes in the Arctic um, at Nome, Wainwright, and Prudhoe to try to maximize science time. Because it always seems to happen that it's good weather when we're transiting to Nome, and when you're back up in the theater is when the weather hits. So we're trying to just maximize science time. And it's, it's been really useful. I know that we've been able to get more science days for um, the researchers. Instead of having to transit, we've now, they, they can get four to five more days of research in. So it's been a very successful program. A lot of it was leveraged by industry funding, um, but we did do it last year without any industry funding, and we were able to get some of it done this year. So we're hoping to continue to move forward with this collaborative effort. Um, for the mobilization, demobilization, like I said, we, we've been able to provide a lot of different services um, to the various organizations. We are based in Anchorage, small group, but we have a warehouse, trucks, shipping accounts, we have worked with all the different charter aircrafts to get people to and from. Um, we have worked with Seward for a lot of years at the Marine Science or the Marine Center down there. We have a truck in Nome for on-ground support and have worked really closely with the Port of Nome for a lot of years. And then with the corporation um, with Alunic, we have a, the Tuck Puck, which is a small landing craft in Wainwright, to be able to do crew changes and resupplies. And the same thing, I have a, a huge amount of support there at Westock to be able to get people on and off in Westock. And some of that is working with uh, BP security to get people to and from uh, Westock, from Prudhoe, and various on-ground support. And in 2014, we had so many, um, we had equipment from Windsor, from, um, I, don't know, I don't know how many, we had um, two huge truckloads that we transferred out to the Norsemen. So we've gotten very good at moving samples, moving equipment safely. Let's see, um, sorry, next one. We're also, one of the things I'm the most proud of is the stakeholder engagement. Um, the picture on the bottom shows our preseason. What I try to do every year before we start the, the field work, no matter what group I'm working with, is I bring in a group of elders who are interested in talking and, and kind of showing everyone about their culture. Um, we've been fortunate to have John Goodwin from Kotzebue out on our vessels multiple years, Billy Adams from Barrow, William Levitt Sr. from Barrow, and we've done a lot of the outreach with the Alaska Eskimo Whaling Commission. Um, we've given presentations and worked with other co-management groups, all of the different ones. Um, we have a large stakeholder distribution list that we've developed over the years of communicating throughout the season. We do have onboard Alaska Native observers and communicators who have been incredible in helping to teach a lot of the students and, and some of the young interns on Arctic work. We have subsistence advisors in communities, logistics support throughout our large joint ventures, and then I am, uh, me and Willow Hetrick are, are permitters for both international, federal, state, and local. So we try to get involved with everything that we can and have a consistent people so that we've built a very strong relationship with the communities. And the picture on the, the right, Kathy, you probably um, recognize that as, as the Scan Eagle that was in 2013, and those, those are the elders in Wainwright blessing the Scan Eagle. Uh, we've also provided a lot of safety management, so it hasn't always been popular with the scientists when they first get on, but it's ended up with nine years of no recordable injuries or environmental spills. We require that people on our vessel go through an offshore survival techniques every other year. We have um, strong protective equipment that they have to wear and onboard daily safety meetings. And if the budgets are there, we're able to provide a preseason safety seminar, and we did those for three years for transboundary. And we can also put a medic on board, an onboard safety officer, whatever we can do to help make sure that everyone comes home safely. And um, our commitment to safety has been shown with our nine years of zero recordables. We won the Governor's Safety Award of Excellence, and we did win the Arctic Technologies Distinguished Achievement Award. So just proud of the team of what we've been able to accomplish. And I feel the key to success, um, I was a basketball player in college, and so I feel team, team membership is very important. I try to get as many people to collaborate and cooperate as much as possible. It's not always easy. Um, working just with three different oil companies was, was uh, took a lot of years off my life, but just working with the industry of more data <laughs> over time and space and 
one large study versus multiple small studies, um, trying to just get everyone together and step, instead of having five separate boats, I was able to get them all on one boat, you know, try to, try, try to make it work for everyone to work together, um, sharing the vessel and scientists, which allows for more consistent data sets, and the biggest thing is sharing the cost for MOBE and transit. And with industry and with some of these guys have also really pushing them to collaborate with the scientific community so that we don't have industry data versus science data. We just have a strong data set throughout the Arctic. And again, the cost sharing for vessel time and developing the safety culture. And again, one of the things that I'm most proud of is, is our interactions with the communities and developing relationships to where there's a strong level of trust with everyone. I've had personal barbecues at my house with Harry Brower and a lot of those guys and just being able to work within the communities so that we can do crew changes in Wainwright near shore and we can collect samples there because we're working with, with the communities to make sure that we're not conflict. And that's all I have. So I'd be open to any questions or any collaborations or things that I've learned the hard way <laughs> um, of what's <laughs> here and what's not. So thanks again Thank for inviting you. me. <laughs> Thank you, Shannon. Does anyone have any questions? I would just uh, point out that Shana and the other pre presentations, and I'm sure Church as well, uh, highlight a, a lot of the commonalities that run through this um, research support and logistics working group. Um, the, the safety culture, finding partnerships, finding efficiencies, you know, working together, community outreach, and including um, stakeholders in decision making. All of these things are the, some of the primary tenets of this group and why we're working together and sharing the lessons learned um, is one of the major reasons why we created this group. So um, I'm sure you'll all be hearing from me in the future to gather some of these things and, and document things and put them um, in a place where other people can find them as well and, and make sure that your contact information is available. So thanks a lot, Shana, for hitting on those really important issues. Um, and so now we have Church from the Alaska Domain Awareness Center. Uh, hi, and, and uh, I would just like to say it's the Arctic Domain Awareness Center. Um, so, uh, but oh, good. We'll we'll, we'll fix that. Thank you. Yeah, a lot of work in in Alaska, but it really we're we're striving towards uh, and coming out uh, expanding approach. Uh, a lot of work that is in Arctic Alaska, but then also uh, increasing work in the North American Arctic, and then ultimately seeking a Pan Arctic approach. Um, I would offer that obviously uh, we are part of the, of the, the University of Alaska uh, between both the Anchorage and Fairbanks campuses hub uh, that is really oriented to a, a pretty extensive and growing network of academics, uh, institutions, and uh, or institute, academic institutions, institutes, and industry. Uh, and so for us, we are. Uh, principally focused on supporting the Arctic operator. Uh, a principal customer in the Arctic operator, of course, uh, is the United States Coast Guard, but increasingly collaboration with, uh, increasing collaboration with Canada's Coast Guard and also seeking uh, over the course of this coming year uh, collaboration with uh, operators uh, in, in uh, Denmark and in Norway as, uh, as an out outgrowth act activity and I'm actually able to pull a little bit of my prior uh, experience as the, the former uh, co-chair of the Arctic Security Forces Roundtable uh, along with a Norwegian uh, uh, general officer. I am a retired general officer myself from the United States Air Force, uh, but the two of us shepherded um, the, essentially a multinational approach, uh, principally in the European theater, but but focused on the in the Pan-Arctic region about how multinational uh, defense support to civil authorities could be brought to bear for search and rescue, humanitarian assistance, and disaster response. So uh, with the team here that I privileged to serve with, the Dr. Liz Kajazi, our principal investigator, uh, Dr. Larry Hensman, who's also the, uh, as our research director, also serves as the vice chancellor for research at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Uh, Heather Paulson, our finance director for UA, uh, with the UAA experience, but a UA focus. Uh, Luann Picard and Elise Hackley are the comprise that leadership team, but we do have a, a fairly decent uh, and growing network of researchers that are focused again in the Arctic domain to support the Arctic operator. Um, obviously for us is really, when it gets right down to it, is how do we help the Coast Guard, principally being that of, of District 17, focus in, in their areas of SAR, humanitarian assistance, disaster response, and leveraging 
essentially knowledge of the domain uh, from both the terrestrial view and then in a scientific value point to help them with decision support uh, and decision making. And I give kind of the summary, if you will, that the, the, no matter how the Coast Guard, whether it's Canada's Coast Guard or U.S. Coast Guard takes the problem on, uh, they're always going to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, <laughs> simply because of the reason too vast and the, the resources are too few. So when we talk about enabling decision support, we're trying to help you bring the science uh, tools to bear with information technologies in such a way that we help cue uh, pending problems and developing churn uh, issues to help them, being the Ar Arctic operator, be close to the right place at the right time. But it's also not only focused on, if you will, a government type operator, but it's also support the public good. How to help um, bring these tools to bear that help the Arctic operator in, in, a, in, in a response type scenario also help you know, support folks that are you know, out there doing actual whaling in indigenous communities, so local communities. So for us, we really have a very wide sector of customers. We have a principal focus, but we really can broaden that and we are seeking to broaden that through an array of federal, state, and local industry and academic partners that collectively work in bringing what we have together to best, best understand each other as well as best understand what's happening in a dynamic uh, and changing environment. Um, I would obviously for us at the end of the day, questions get asked to us all the time. So what is domain awareness? It's a sexy term that people like to, to throw about but not necessarily knowing exactly what does it mean. And so uh, as a former and recovering math major, um, I, I go to a basic, uh, you know, basic algebraic thought here. If you take a bunch of environmental factors in simplest terms and aggregate them together and try to understand what you, each of those variables mean, you get an approximate understanding of what, quote, is the domain. Uh, and I, I look at it from a matrix view, and for us, is not only knowing these variables from a terrestrial or reason-wide view, but also from a, uh, from a 3D column aspect of looking from really from the seabed to the surface, thinking about that ice layer when it's there and what's appropriate and then from the surface to really somewhere south of the stratosphere. Each of the environmental factors is changing increasingly so, of course, in the high no across the high north. And for us, we're trying to get at this, you know, if, if, so through a series of sensors, models, platforms that get sensors out on the scene, and then getting access to authoritative data sources that we ourselves don't develop but are, are can connect to with authoritative data sources. Sensors on scene, of course, then best to understand for the crisis uh, piece there. For us, we are currently uh, have an underwater platform, for example, development that gets sensors out on scene long range under autonomous vantage point under the, under the ice. One of the things we're interested in trying to do is in complement to Kathy Cahill's discussions uh, is how to remotely pilot aircraft uh, or unmanned aerial systems. I prefer RPA because I'm a recovering Air Force guy. but. Uh, but how does unmanned aerial platforms or remotely piloted aircraft get out on scene and sensors in such a way they can be autonomously launched, sensors on scene and autonomously recovered, and then re reconfigured for, again, the subsequent autonomous launch? And the reason why this really matters is because resources are thin and marginal weather conditions in the, in, in the Arctic region means you probably, there's times that an unmanned aerial platform can get out on scene when, and when really a manned platform cannot, and simply because the weather conditions don't permit when you have, you don't have precision air force all around them, they are the high north to be able to launch and recover from, from, from manned platforms. So for us, domain awareness in the end of the day is focused on this comprehensive view, getting all the variables that we can better understood through science, technology, research, and development, and really trying to, to better understand each variable and then the aggregation of those variables to get at uh, a, an understanding of what domain awareness is. We realized for us that, that in order to get domain awareness, realized you have to have partnerships. You have to focus on the current known understandings and then seeking what are those gaps and operational deficiencies and then really partnership with U.S. Coast Guard, principally for us as Coast Guard Research Development Center uh, in District 17 in Juneau, an uh, anchored sector here uh, with, the, with the folks uh, of U.S. Coast Guard in this part of the, of the, of the state, and then ultimately a network of folks that are both in Canada and the United States focused in trying to better understanding uh, the environmental factors uh, with this, this, this specific region. For us, obviously, as a, as a consortium of, of academics, industry, state, and federal uh, 
you know, can try and get this network approach, we realize that the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, National Weather Service, has significant mutual interest in trying to understand these environmental factors. So a, a close collaboration and partnership with them is certainly a, a priority effort for us and been working for that in quite some time. As a, as a Department of Homeland Security uh, enterprise, though, we are also challenged to help grow the next workforce. And so for us, we are, we are really trying to create and we've got a good start this last over the last about six, seven months, and now trying to help move that into this next year of growing a future workforce of, of Arctic-focused uh, professionals that can enter into the, the Department of Homeland Security uh, enterprise uh, as, as uh, one upon graduation. We realize that the network matters, so we've got a fair number of people that help us with and various facets when this is between areas of modeling and sensors community-based observers for, situ uh, for situational awareness. So this is a, an applied research area with the University of Idaho-led uh, effort uh, by Dr. Lalisa, who is a, a tremendous researcher in this area, of how to get community-based observers uh, in, through applied research to be able to see what matters, send, say something, send something, and what they send that makes sense to the Arctic operator and be able to, to have actual information from from both a security standpoint, but a disaster response specifically, and also supporting citizen science. Uh, for us, of course, partnership with the U.S. Coast Guard include the Center of Arctic Study and Policy, as well as the folks that are helping us comprise, again, model sensors platforms, and a flagship of our effort is a fusion of all the data that we can provide and that we can gain in a way that is actually really directly enables agile decision support and leveraging existing capabilities to make sure we're not duplicating effort but really advancing those areas that we can as best we can. Um, we know that collaboration really matters. I've hit it on this a bit and we're, we know that this is where we're at today. It's not where we're going to be tomorrow, but we're in route to trying to be as comprehensive oriented as we can. Uh, obviously in the interest of time here, our projects are at a glance on the screen. We're looking at sensors, both machine and people. People, of course, are the community-based observers. The tons of platforms, again, a, a big effort for us at the Woods Hole Institute that gets censored out on the scene uh, through an autonomous platform. And in a perfect world, we'll be able to get gliders and platforms a way to get that, really get to that 3D column view. But again, that's a work in progress. We are doing some hard product development with uh, a long range of autonomous underwater vehicle. Um, and then modeling for us, again, from environmentally focused and then fusing this. One other piece of this, of course, is professional Arctic mariner development. That matters for us in, in helping prepare future operators comply with the polar code. And then the, the one of the biggest pieces for us that's uh, an area where we can invest a community of people, and this is Arctic-related incident and national statements and a medium long-term environment workshops. Um, so the bottom line for us is that trying to find a ways of, of bringing people together to think through tough problems the operators are given us. And, and the biggest context I could offer to this is, uh, is having operators drive the research agenda. And we've just concluded the first Arctic Ions workshop here on the 21st, 22nd of June. We're near final in a, uh, both the rapporteur's report and request for proposal to actually conduct research driven from that forum, which was really queued up uh, by our Arctic operator. Um, and in focus of time, I've kind of started about the relationship to this. I would cue you to the slide showing the interrelationship of projects we have at the end of the day as much as we can moving into Arctic fusion. We're at the cusp edge of getting an ice conditions index project literally this morning. We got it approved from Coast Guard Research Development Center to be able to fuse as much as we can from what we do versus what we can gain, again, to help enable that decision maker. Um, I have details in the slide deck. In the interest of time, though, I just wanted to give you this briefest snapshot. I don't think I took a breath, so happy to take on any questions in the time I have. Uh, I am out and standing by. All right. Any questions for Church? Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I think, uh, Peter, I'm going to turn to you for an update and then hand it to Jessica, and then we'll wrap it up. Um, I know we're running a little bit over. Um, Kathy had to leave, too. so. Right, I'll be very. Take I'm it away, of, Peter. Uh, I'm kind of uh, jumping in at the last minute. There was some it seemed like there was some interest on a quick update from above. We've done a uh, NASA's Arctic Boreal Vulnerability Experiment. Uh, you can find our complete um, implementation plan at above.nasa.gov. Uh, we had uh, about 30 teams that were active across uh, the. Uh, terrestrial focused domain of above um, 
and uh, quite a, the highest concentration were supported out of uh, Fairbanks. Uh, so we have a, a small um, field support office in Fairbanks uh, that has a half-time person uh, and uh, some equipment, field equipment, and um, opportunities for uh, training and uh, and uh, some of, uh, of the shared scientific equipment. Uh, we've benefited greatly from several partnerships with NSF pro uh, uh, funded activities, uh, strategic partnership with, uh, with US Array uh, has um, allowed us to uh, deploy some of our core uh, measurements into areas of Alaska and Western Canada that are very difficult to get to. Um, so we have ground temperature profilers and weather stations in cooperation with uh, National Weather Service uh, that are in the process of augmenting these U.S. array sites. Um, we've uh, benefited from uh, working with the NSF UNAVCO group on getting um, a, a uh, GPS, uh, survey grade GPS units into the hands of our researchers. Um, and we have, um, you were talking earlier, one of the people about some of the teamwork aspect and the safety culture. Um, very delighted to see that uh, that the safety training emphasis that that we brought into a group of primarily university-based uh, investigators really has been embraced by the scientists. And we have um, quite a number who have uh, taken courses that we've either recommended or that we've provided ourselves. Um, and um, quite certain that that's going to uh, pay off in terms of uh, safety over the next uh, eight years as we continue the field campaign. Um, we have a airborne solicitation that is um, in the uh, post-submission uh, pre-selection stage uh, right now, so in 2017, we expect to have somewhere between three to five aircraft uh, operating across uh, this region, and um, we'll probably want to give uh, this group some uh, update on that when those plans are formalized a bit more, which would be after the selection of the successful projects. That's really Great. quick because I know everybody's got to run. All right, thank you very much uh, for that update. And we will, you know, this group will continue to work with agencies that are planning field campaigns to identify um, aircraft, vessels, and other um, opportunities where people can work together or at least be mutually aware and, again, share our wisdom on um, coordinating with the communities and people on the ground. So, um, Jessica, you had something else that you wanted to add, and then I think that's it for the speakers, and I'll wrap it up. Yeah, this should just take a minute. I just wanted to point out that we had a really productive um, observing team meeting. And actually, I wasn't at the meeting, but Sarah was. So she was going to uh, summarize it for us. And yeah, so the page. Um, great. take it away, Sarah. Before we go to that, Renee, I just have a quick question for Peter. Um, Peter, I have a quick question before I uh, summarize this other um, meeting. And that was, who, who organized the safety training? Was it one, one training, or, or have you done these individually? How, how was that organized? It's, uh, it's been very adaptive. Um, our uh, safety um, risk management uh, officer um, is uh, Dan Hawkinson, who I think uh, Renee and maybe some of the others of you uh, know. And mm -hmm. uh, we, we have on our, uh, on our website for the funded, NASA funded investigators a hazard analysis uh, um, web tool that, that we do the first pass with the PIs of every team to identify the range of risks that need to be mitigated. Uh, and then we develop a, uh, a um, education plan for, um, for each member of each team. Uh, that's cleared with the PI that is a combination of web-based training, uh, recommendations for um, commercial or agency uh, opportunities, um, and uh, when the possibility exists for ha having a concentrated group of 
of uh, investigators will arrange either for uh, for Dan, who is, is certified for providing training for, in quite a number of areas, uh, or uh, a um, you know a professional uh, trainer to come in. And we've done uh, some um, some horse trading. I uh, probably shouldn't say, I think Renee probably knows this, we've been done, doing some horse trading with uh, CPS and sometimes uh, you know, get uh, some of their people into our things and our people into their things and that, uh, that kind of thing to, uh, in, a, in a very flexible uh, way to try to you know, minimize the inconvenience and, and, um, and minimize the cost. Yeah, exactly. So in, in, uh, Very cool. in certain Thank occasions, that, there can Peter. be a... Go ahead. Great. And Sarah, did you have anything else you wanted to say? Uh, no, uh, thank you for that, Peter. Um, I'll just really briefly summarize that there was a um, uh, observing sy uh, systems collaboration team meeting um, held um, last month. And um, uh, you may want to just take a look at it. You can um, see the recording. Jessica's pulled it up on the website. Um, if you um, search for um, the last, uh, the July Arctic Observing Systems Collaboration Team meeting, you'll find it. Um, but just very briefly, it was it, uh, might be of interest to many people on this phone call because it was really an informal catalog of data tools that assist us with US observing efforts. And so it covered things like the Arctic Observing Viewer, the um, AUS Research Assets Map, the NSSI catalog, um, ACERS catalog of long-term monitoring efforts, and ABOVE's Geo um, Ecological Atlas. Um, so a really nice summary of five of these different tools. The discussion that followed was really quite interesting as well, and that was focused on the need to perhaps better coordinate between these tools. They all seem to serve um, uh, overlapping, uh, uh, specific interests that often overlap. And so um, there was clearly a need for better communication. And one of the things that's going to happen is there's going to be a, a workshop on data interoperability um, taking place in Frescati, Italy. That's an international workshop, but to prepare for that, our Adiwig group will probably have a workshop also in the November. So people who are interested in kind of once the observations are done, what happens with them? How do we know where ships are? Um, what are what are some of those tools that we use? Um, might want to take a look at that. Um, all the presentations are available, and the recording is also available. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. Great. 